Welcome to The Hot Dish, comfort food for middle America. I'm Heidi Heitkamp. And I'm Joel Heitkamp. Today is November 6th, the day after uh, the 2024 elections, but we recorded this last week. We'll have a post-election bonus episode out soon. want to thank all our listeners for your continued support. We really love hearing from you, so please keep those questions and suggestions coming. Uh, reach out to us via email at podcast at onecountryproject.org and be sure to check out onecountryproject.org for more updates on what we're doing to lift up rural voices in Washington. For this episode, Joel spoke with Dee Davis, founder of the Center for Rural Strategies, where they had an enlightening conversation on how to amplify the voices of rural communities through media. But first, Joel, you also spoke with a couple of people that's right, Hyde. I spoke with uh, two of the founders of the pro-gun Democrats. I didn't know that it was going to be with Joe Mason, and I didn't know it was going to be with T.D. Hill, but I'm, I'm thankful like you wouldn't believe that the organization that they've built is the type of organization that I think is so desperately needed out there. Now, these individuals are co-founders of pro-gun Democrats. And I welcome you to the hot dish. TD, good to have you with us. Thank you. Good to be here. You bet. And Joe, same to you. Good to be with Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. All right. One of you two started pro-gun Democrats. One of you two was sitting with the other one and said, you know what we should do? I don't know which one of you it is, but whoever it is, go ahead and kick in. Why'd you do it? Well, TD and I met at work. Uh, Alex Fortner, our other co-founder, we met at a uh, gun show. And we all have had an interest in politics for uh, quite a while. And one of the things that we've been concerned about, even pre-Trump, was that there's a lot of misinformation that too many Americans have come to believe and that's influencing their politics. We attend a lot of gun shows. We attend a lot of military collectors, collector shows, and we run into this repeatedly. People talking about the fact that they think Trump won the 2020 election. They think that uh, the Affordable Care Act is socialized medicine. Most recently, of course, you've, you've heard that uh, people are thinking that patient immigrants are eating people's pets in Springfield, Ohio. So we, we were very concerned about that. And in sort of the little niche environment that, that we operate in, we decided to start our website mostly for our own informational purposes to store stories and uh, data that we wanted to quickly reference. Over time, we decided we want to share this with some of the people that we're talking with. And so we formalized the site a little more and uh, we're making it available to those people that we talk with. That's kind of a, a brief background and how we got started. So TD, is this something that you were looking at uh, like I was and saying, man, uh, I've got to get to work on this. This is something we in the rural area desperately need. Yeah, I felt very, very strong about it. Because as you know, you know in rural America, I mean, there's, there's a strong Christian base. And it seems that right has reached out through that uh, channel to churches and pastors and so forth, conferences, and that have impacted people. Seems to have the narrative that they have a monopoly, patriotism, and the Constitution. That's just not true. I mean, well, a lot of the things that affect people's day-to-day -day lives really are being better represented by the Democrats. But that doesn't seem to be the messaging. You know, I just felt like it was kind of urgent, uh, like uh, Joe said, you know, kind of dispel some of the rumors and the myths and get back to reality. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to you, uh, TD, on this one first, uh, which is I could easily ask, you know, why the public believes that Democrats don't use guns, that Democrats don't see gun ownership as a right that we have as well, and that the public has a narrative that Democrats all want to take your guns. Where did that start from? That's a good question. I mean, you know, there's a lot of us, you know, I, I come from a very blue area, to be honest with you, and uh, I come from a union family, and um, most of my dad's family were hunters. And so I've had guns in my hand ever since I can remember. And the idea that uh, only conservatives are gun owners and passionate about the Second Amendment is just, just false. Well, and Joe, I'm going to phrase it a little bit different. 
which is, do we let the media get by with it? Is that why uh, what you're doing with the pro-gun Democrats so important? Because media just continues at that one in a box narrative, and they never talk to individuals like us three. Definitely on uh, on the right wing media side, that's that's all you hear is that Democrats want to take your guns away. And in the, um, I guess as Tom Hartman might say, the corporate media, they don't, they don't seem to offer the other side either. Well, let me throw another one under that same kind of direction, because I think it goes to something that, that we have that people in general don't have. And that's a a knowledge of guns, a knowledge of weapons. You know, we hear them use certain terms, certain terms that instantly put everything into a box. Uh, for example, oftentimes they believe any gun with a synthetic stock is an AR. They believe and don't understand what certain guns do mechanically, and they believe it it works completely different than what you and I know. And Joe, I want to throw this one at you. How can we have common sense gun laws and tell the people that that write them on the left understand how a weapon works? One of the problems, that, and, and just getting back to your previous question too, is that there are a lot of people on the left who do advocate taking at least some guns away from gun owners. If you remember back in... 2020, when Beto O'Rourke was running for president, I believe he was, he was, uh, he actually said, hell yeah, we're going to take your guns. That just plays right into the right wing narrative. And, you know, that, that's, that, that gets back to, you know, why we started our site and why we've been now trying to promote it more is to, particularly in rural America, where, you know, I think citizens are getting misled by the right-wing media that has done an effective job in misleading them on this issue. I couldn't agree more. Uh, TD, when it comes to that, when it comes to being able to change the narrative in light of everything that's going on in the world out there, when, you, when you've when you got a guy leaving his gun a, at a fence line at a golf course, when you have another one crawling up on a roof trying to, to shoot a former president of the United States, You've got all of these school shootings. I guess what I'm building to here is, do you think people are ever going to change their minds on guns, period? I mean, do you think that your work can get out there strong enough to say, listen, we just want to tell you what what guns are and what we do with guns? Yeah, that's a tough one. Like you said, the, the 24-hour media and the corporate media they tend to play these things on loop, you know, over and over again, show the tragedies and the horror and uh, the bad things. They're not showing people, you know, going to the range and just enjoying target shooting and you know, going hunting and father-son moments, family moments. I think that we can reach people, and I think that we have reached people in the sense that first we have to start off by finding our commonalities, and then we can better communicate our our differences. Uh, Joe, I'm going to throw this one at you because as with anything, there is some middle ground in there that it seems to me that we as gun owners should be willing to talk about and yield to. And then there are things that kind of on the left that they should understand a little better. In other words, this, having served in the state Senate, doing a talk show, oftentimes I've pointed out that I, you know, if I looked at anything when it comes to control when it comes to guns. I think there should be a three-day waiting period. I don't think there should be binary triggers. I don't think there should be bump stocks. I think we should be able to limit the size of clips. You see where I'm going with this, Joe. I mean, you you can do all of those things without taking someone's guns and yet making them work in a way that they should work, Joe. And, you know, we, when we talk to gun owners, we try to bring things up exactly what you're, you're talking about. One of the things that we face, though, is organizations like the NRA and others are digging their heels in. And they, maybe for political reasons, they aren't looking to compromise. And I'm more optimistic that we can some middle ground with the left than I am that we can reach some middle ground with the right. 
you know, one-on-one, you know, I think we have some success when we talk with people. Our feeling is that when I talk to somebody at a gun show, say, and we get into this subject, I say to them, what can we do to keep guns out of hands of people who should not have them? And a lot of times that sets these people back. They have not really thought that through yet. And the more we talk about it, the more some of the things that you brought up start making more sense to them. But too often they're in this world where they just are talking to people just like them. They're talking to people on Facebook who they're not really discussing an issue. They're just giving brief little soundbite answers. You know, you can't really reach people when you're talking in sound bites. And, and that's why we like talking to people one-on-one, just in person. And as uh, Tim Walt said at the convention, you know, we're going to move the ball down the field one yard at a time, one inch at a time, one voter at a time. And hopefully we're, we're making some impact there. I've had the pleasure of, of having Tim Walls on my show a number of times. And the one thing that I know is the fact he knows what it's like to put on camel and go out and get after the pheasants a little bit, which I, I think all three of us, whether it's deer hunting or pheasant hunting or duck and goose, uh, but it doesn't change the fact that the right is defining us, that, that we're not engaging in the conversation. That's why I'm so happy to hear your group, the, the, the pro-gun Democrats. And let me throw it to you this way, TD. So you're sitting in a room, uh, as many of us have, with a number of people that do exactly what we do. Maybe we're shooting trap, maybe we're out hunting, whatever. And they start this. They start this, we as Democrats want to take away your guns. How hard is it when you're in that room? And obviously, you guys want to engage in that conversation, so I know you do. How hard is it to get heads nodding up and down, agreeing with what you're saying? It really depends on the audience. You know, I think that going back to what Joe had said earlier, speaking in sound bites, talking to people on social media, people are accustomed to that type of dialogue and discourse now. People often just listen to respond. You don't listen to understand. So first you have to kind of make sure you have a rapport with people and that you're actually having a conversation, not talking at one another. Once that's established, Honestly, because we do have that commonality of enjoying, you know, the outdoors, using guns in, in a responsible manner. Some people will take a hard line and just, you know, regurgitate the talking points. But a lot of times it's like, yeah, you know, a lot of this stuff does make sense. It's a lot of fear, you know, of the guns being taken away. But I found that through talking to people one-on-one that we can find some common ground. Now, does it always mean they're going to flip the script and vote a different way? That's a little bit, sometimes a little bit harder to send them dying. I had a gentleman call into my radio show the other day and, and his message to my audience was, and it was interesting the first way he said it, he said, they're coming. And then there was a long pregnant pause. And then he goes, they're coming. And the point wasn't they're coming for my guns as somebody who owned guns, the individual did. His point was that next generation, if not my children, but my grandchildren are going to say, to heck with you. We're, we're not going to sit here under this whole old uh, thought that the Second Amendment reads the way we want it to read. We're going we're gonna to sit here and have some common sense gun laws, or they are going to go to a further place than what any of us should, because they're in the generation that's getting shot up in schools. And Joe, I'm, I'm curious what you think of that, what you thought of that caller. You know, when we talk with people and, and, One of the things that that I bring up with them is, okay, how do we stop all these senseless shootings? And I think we can agree. Well, I hope we can agree, uh, everybody, that there are people who should not own guns, that they are a danger to themselves. They're a danger to a spouse. They're a danger to others. And that's that's where, you know, we, we need to... We need, to, we need to challenge the right and say, listen, if we don't come up with a solution to keep, the guns, to keep guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them, then that is going to happen. Guns will get taken away because people are going to reach a point where they think that's the only solution. And so I, I, I challenge those on the right to join us and, and engage in trying to come up with some common sense solutions 
to the senseless shootings that we're seeing on just a far too often basis. Well, and, and here's my frustration, guys. We had some of that. I mean, we had a, a ban on automatic weapons, right? So mm -hmm. here we are down to semi-automatic weapons. And then they find ways to get around it. They put bump stocks on it, so they shoot quicker. They put binary triggers on it. You know, the recent shooting we had in the, the, the Georgia schools, I believe I, I, I read that, that Governor Kemp immediately thereafter came out and said, now's not the time to talk about gun legislation. Well, there never does seem to be a time to talk about it with, with those folks on the far right. It can be very frustrating. All I can say is we just keep plugging along, you know, one yard at a time, one inch at a time. And um, let's challenge these myths that are out there. Let's bust these myths that are out there that too many people are believing these days. Well, guys, I think a lot of us as Democrats uh, that, that understand exactly what you're talking about are pretty glad there's a group like pro-gun Democrats to take this on. Uh, Joel, what's your website? How do they get in touch with you guys? www.theprogundemocrat.com. Guys, thank you. Keep doing what you're doing. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Joel. Great. Thanks for having us on, Joel. You know, this is a real treat for me. I've been looking forward to this. I get to visit with Dee Davis. Now, Dee is the founder for the Center for Rural Strategies and a, a Carsey Senior Fellow. Now, here's the thing. We here at One Country are trying to find any possible ways to communicate that rural message to the world. Well, I'm about to talk to a master of that, uh, and that is Dee Davis. Dee, good to have you on with us here at One Country. Thanks, Joel. I'm glad to be here. I mean, the, you're built for the hot dish. I mean, you are. You're you're just built for this conversation, man. I mean, you've spent decades amplifying the voices of rural communities, and media, uh, public information campaigns. I mean, this has been a passion of yours, D. Well, I have to do something to keep out of the streets. I think <laughs> that, you know, uh, we had some adventures. We got to make some movies and tell some stories and that's all fun. And uh, this work is fun, too. You know, I think that helping get rural stories out is worth the effort. And, you know, you make new friends all the time. Well, the hot dish is meant to bring rural to, to urban and meant to tie rural together. Um, but I'm going to ask you the obvious question. Do we in the rural area matter? Yeah, it's interesting because um, this has been the election cycle that we've been kind of hoping for in, in the last Clinton Gore won rural America. And then there was a kind of a decision by the Democrats to just ignore it and hope it goes away. And so you go from 50% or more of the rural votes being Democrat to just becoming a one-party Republican stronghold where nobody has to promise anything or change anything because only one party shows up. So this has been interesting because with walls on the ticket, the narrative started to shift. There's been a lot of discussion rural. I wouldn't say it's always informed. I mean, I don't know how many news stories I've heard about Harrison Walls and rural Savannah, Georgia, you know, it could be 400,000 people there, but it's like, that's rural because it's not Atlanta. And I think that in some ways that it's an attempt to go back and reclaim the discourse, right? To be part of the debate, which I think for rural communities is pretty important, right? I think we just felt left out. Not Maybe you could say ignored, but in, in some way, is this like the point that you said, do we matter? It's like, are we noticed? Yeah. Well, and I'll give an example of, of my life here as a, as a talk show host in Montana, South Dakota, North Dakota, you know, Minnesota, big areas there, huge red area. But if instead of losing three out of four votes or, or three out of five votes, you know, you lose you know, two or three, that that's a good day. I mean, if you just gain one here or there. And so it always, 
leaves questions. And, and the question I would have for you, D, is this redistricting and the Democrats are just as guilty of this as anyone of carving out these safe congressional districts. Has that hurt us in the rural area? When you have non-competitive races, then the whole idea of a, a democratic way to address your issues, solve your problems, goes away. You don't need to have a good, honest argument. You don't have to put all the cards on the table because the political solution has already been determined before you go to the polls. So that doesn't help. And I mean, I think in this, we've done some polling in the last year or so, and I was interested in what it found because it had found that the Democrats supported a narrative about a third in in the rural battleground states that we looked at in in Montana, I think was among those. But what it showed that I wasn't expecting was, I think probably. 30, 35% of the votes were gettable. They could go either way. And then more interestingly, I think was what messages people were hurting. They, they definitely were not happy about the cost of gas or eggs. But what I was not expecting was there was a kind of just a rancorous anti-corporate feeling that the people were mad at the businesses, the big businesses, they were ready for somebody to step up and uh, speak up for them. The whole insulin price thing was an important issue. So it, it wasn't so easy to pigeonhole rural responses in kind of Republican MAGA talking points. They were, people were still interested. And if you could go one step farther, what I would say, if I were to characterize the way that rural voters felt, was back to your point about mattering, is that they want to be part of the solution. I mean, they've spent a lot of time feeding and fueling and providing resources and providing labor for this country to prosper. And they don't want to be left out of the story. They don't want to be left out of the American narrative. They feel like they've got a way to contribute. And it's not just taking care of themselves. They like taking care of others. And I think in some ways, when political decisions are made for efficiency, well, these are where our voters are. There are more people here. We're just going to work on delivering these votes. That is kind of like understanding the cost of everything and the value of nothing is kind of understanding one side of the picture, but not understanding the other. And I think that that politics is cultural. It's emotional. It's not just cold, hard policy facts. And the reason I took you down that trail to, to start this conversation was really because of what you do, which is, you know, to tell that real story to get out there and, and use media, use public information. How do we get to where we're paid attention to? Yeah, I think, first of all, it helps when the politicians show up. I mean, that's if they show up, then you can tell them a story. And it's not just about sending messages. It's about being in a conversation. It's about listening as much as it is talking. And I think in some ways that when, when people show up in your neighborhood, have an honest conversation about what, what the community needs, what the community hopes for, what the community's tore up about, then I think you have a kind of an honest place to begin a constructive relationship. Yeah. yeah you, you say when they show up, though, and you take, the, the state I live in, that I choose to live in right here in North Dakota, you know, the, the, we had the Farmers Union go to a fly-in in D.C., and this is the third or fourth year in a row they've been there, as many as, you know, 70 people at times, and they can't get one of our United States senators to meet with them because he just feels like he doesn't have to meet with them. And, and so it's awful tough to make him come to your small town cafe when he doesn't even come back to the state. 
Well, I think in some ways that's that's part of how you have to push back on the stories. That's how you have to tell the story so that you, you can't be ignored. In this um, electronic communications system that we're observing now, it's harder and harder to get people uh, face-to-face, but, but get your neighbors face-to-face. You can get your pals. You can Towns can talk to other towns. You can begin to change a conversation. It just takes some effort and a little pluck. So if you could explain to people how you build that story. If you have this story that's happening in this area, this rural area, and it's, you know, somebody with the talents that you have says, this story deserves to be told. It, It needs to be out there. How do you make that happen, D? Well, I think in a way you got to you got to be an honest broker, right? You can't just tell the stories that benefit you. You got to be in an honest conversation and and you know it's like real life's not always cake and sauce. People aren't always doing their best, but a lot of people have hopes. A lot of people have a desire to do good, and I think in some ways that You've got to tell a story that people understand. You know, we all feel the sun on our back. We get wet in the rain. We fear death. We worry about our kids. Are they going to be all right? We look after uh, people in our community who are down on their luck. I think in some ways you've got to start the story in a place that's real for everybody, not just not just for people in your community, not just for rural people, but for people everywhere. You got to build those bridges, and the stories will change people. They'll change their outlooks. If you tell a good story, then people can respond. They can be part of it. So I think part of it is it's just it's just what you say down at the cafe. You just tell that story, and, and people who are practiced at call and respond. People are practiced. Uh, telling the tale, getting response. And I think in a way you just have to figure out how to get that story scaled up a little bit. And, you know, and now with, um, with all the technology, you can get that story out a little bit better here and there, you know, there's some ways to do it. And, and so it doesn't work every time, but, but, you know, you just keep pushing. You can just kind of keep trying your best to make content. D. Davis is our guest here on The Hot Dish, and we're talking about how to connect uh, with more of an urban area from a rural area. D., I'm sitting here looking at my granddaughter, and uh, she's a better communicator, I think, than what I ever will be. And she is because of this, not because she brings more passion to the argument. In fact, I think she's just learning how to do that. But the tools that she uses, you know, the, the methods that she goes about, it's a changing world. She has the ability to convey a message electronically and have it go to places that one would have hoped to if he was going to accomplish the goals that we're talking about. Uh, I don't know if you're seeing that in your life as well. I was at a t-ball game the other day with uh, my five-year-old grandson and uh his twin sister came and got on uh my lap and said pop i want to go to the concession stand i would have probably bought the concession stand for her you know at that <laughs> point it's like it, <laughs> if her mother hadn't stopped me you know i think in some ways it's like um we are touched by uh human responses to problems. We're touched by people who feel joy. We're uh, touched by people who give a little extra effort to help out. And I think in some ways, those are the tools that you use in communication. Those are the tools you use in your community. And uh, even when things are looking bleak, those are the foundational ways we move forward is to understand what we have in common. D, tell people where to find your work, because I'll tell you what, I want to know as well. 
Well, the Center for Rural Strategies is uh, based here in Whitesburg, Kentucky, but we kind of work everywhere. Uh, the Daily Yonder is our publication. You can go to dailyyonder.com, and that's that's our newspaper, but it's also a way to link into our multimedia work. It's a way to link into the Rural Assembly, which is a organization of rural organizations. It's a way to to find us. So, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate you taking time with us here on The Hot Dish. I really enjoyed getting to visit. You bet. Such a pleasure. I think it's been a spirited episode and a special episode with these two unique guests sharing important perspectives and information. Joel, I'm telling you, that is a question I get all the time from people who live on the coast who don't have, you know, kind of our experience with the Second Amendment and how people feel about their guns. Well, and the thing I would add to that, Heidi, is, you know, a lot of people don't understand guns maybe the way you and I do. Uh, you know, we grew up with them. Well, I sure enjoyed hearing from them. Let us know what you think. Ask us questions. Give us your suggestions. Thank you for joining us today on The Hot Dish, which is brought to you by One Country Project. Uh, make sure the voices of the rest of us are heard in Washington. Learn more at onecountryproject.org. We'll be back in two weeks with more Hot Dish Comfort Food. For Middle America, stay tuned for a post-election bonus episode. And remember, you could email us at podcast at onecountryproject.org. Thank you.